Hi everybody, welcome to Bone to Pick. I am Michael Davis. I am super psyched to uh, have an opportunity to sit down today uh, with our Artist of the Month for November. Um, simply one of the greatest trumpet players anywhere in the world. Uh, without question, one of my favorite trumpet players here in New York, a very dear friend of mine, the great Nick Marchione. Nick has held the lead trumpet chair in the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra since uh, 2005, has also been the lead trumpet player of the Birdland Big Band since 2006, uh, toured and recorded extensively with the late great Prince. Uh, he has uh, played with Michelle Legrand, bs and Aretha Franklin, Phil Woods, uh, is featured prominently as the lead trumpet player on the upcoming CD by Brett Eldridge, an incredible Christmas album that Rob Mounsey arranged. Um, he has performed on countless Broadway shows, including at the age of 19, securing a chair on the, uh, the mega hit producers. Uh, he is a native of Philadelphia. He is, well, how can we say it? He's the, uh, the person uh, credited with popularizing the cha. Uh, I guess you'd have to say that Maynard was the one who invented it, but certainly Nick has brought it to the people. And uh, we will talk at great length about the cha. Um, he... Uh, my own personal experience, uh, we go way back, but we uh, had some great years uh, playing together on a Broadway show called Memphis that ended up winning a Tony Award back in 2010. And uh, one of the things that uh, amazed me about Nick is uh, he's one of these guys who's got phenomenal perfect pitch and a photographic memory. I'm, I remember we, uh, we started the show and I can barely remember my name and address, so I'm a year and a half into the thing, I'm still reading the music. Of course, he had already closed the book after about two weeks and uh, had it completely memorized. He and I both went on to do other shows and left Memphis, and uh, subsequently those shows had closed, and we came back and ended up subbing together on Memphis about two years after uh, we had left, and uh, he still didn't open the book, so it's a little bit uh, depressing for me. But anyway, he's a great friend. I'm also very honored that he uh, played so beautifully on uh, my CD, Hip Bone Big Band, that came out a couple of months ago. We will be uh, performing live at Subculture on December 4th. If you're around, you get to hear this incredible guy. And without further ado, uh, welcome to uh, Bone to Pick, to Nick Marchion. Thanks so much, Nick, for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, making me feel better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Not possible, but but anyway, you know what? Let's jump right in. Your 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 upbringing and uh, childhood is so rich, and and you you uh, as I mentioned, you come from Philadelphia, an incredibly uh, fruitful place to uh, in terms of music and jazz and and brass playing. Uh, your father was a legendary trumpet player, Tony. He, uh, we were talking about it before the interview. This is a man who was a teacher to Lee Morgan, Randy Brecker, Bobby Malik. Some amazing musicians came under his tutelage, so and and of course his son Nick Marchion. So Nick, tell us about growing up in Philly and your dad and all those experiences. Uh, well, uh, yeah, you know honestly, I still people say this still to me all the time. Guys that live in New York, uh, or still when I go down and teach at Temple University, so still when I go down and see some of the guys uh, there, guys that were professionals working when I was a little kid and dad would bring me along to all the gigs and I'll still meet random people just never met them in my life they'll come up to me on the street or I'll get an email uh, hey uh, I studied with your father in 1958 and blah 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 and I'd love to come see you or come to meet you and it's always very humbling that he touched so many people uh, that whether or not they're still professionals are still have all this great remembrances of him uh, so, in addition to that, my mother is also uh, a pianist, a great pianist. So, both my family, both my parents being these great musicians, uh, was, you know, you're a kid, you don't realize how lucky you are. Mm -hmm. That, you know, instead of having like an accountant and a lawyer and being miserable, I got <laughs> two parents that are musicians and swinging. <laughs> so, um, and your sister you, played uh, as well, right? A clarinet, yes, my older clarinet, sister's a played clarinet. great clarinet player. Mm -hmm. Uh, she went to Curtis, as my dad did, uh, and my older brother and my little sister are scientists. Mm. So, see where the brains went. Yeah. <laughs> I've killed brain cells, they just keep accruing them, apparently. Well, it is pretty amazing. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would be like to teach Lee Morgan a private lesson. I mean, what, yeah, I what, mean... What do you say to Lee Morgan? Uh, <laughs> what do you say to Randy? Yeah, I mean, Randy as well, of you course, know I mean? no question. Um, of course, I'm not old enough to have ever met Lee, uh, 
nor did I, I've heard stories of the of the two of them and their relationship, which was apparently very good because they're not that far off in age. If my dad was alive, he'd be uh, eighty two. Okay, so they're not uh, big disparate in age, but um, apparently they just got along really well. And when Lee was having some, of course, not musical issues, but maybe right, just right. some more fundamentally trumpet things that he wanted to get better on and resolve. And my father was known as very much a uh, great musician, great player, but a great teacher, like a fix-it man kind of mm -hmm. thing. I have much more experience talking to Randy about uh, Philly in that era and also with my dad. And, you know, Randy is, is great because his comments are so succinct but <laughs> and dry, but very uh, contained with great information. So uh, talking to him about my dad revealed a lot of uh, personality, mm. shall we say. <laughs> That's great. And Randy's such a, well, he's a genius musician and we're, we're all such huge fans of his, but he's also a big ambassador for Philadelphia and, and yeah. you know, the, the lineage of great players that have uh, come from that great city. So that's uh, very cool. Well, let's jump ahead and talk a little bit about your move to New York. You came here. Uh, it's hard to believe. I mean, I remember when everybody was talking to, you know, this young kid, literally a kid who was 18 years old. Uh, just moved to New York. Nick Marchion, you got to hear this kid. It's unbelievable. I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, but you moved here uh, shortly thereafter. Within a year, you landed the chair on the producers, which is phenomenal. I mean, I think uh, the only person I can think of that young who had a Broadway uh, position was uh, Winton when he got the chair at Sweeney Todd. I think he was yeah. 18 or 19. But uh, any rate, talk about it. <laughs> <Excuse laughs> talk, talk, yes, of course. Uh, talk about, uh, if you would, like your memories of, of getting to New York and what, I know you went to Manus for uh, a little bit and was it at that time, I know you studied with Vince, the great Vince Penzarella was maybe, maybe just kind of share your feelings about what it was like diving into the deep end of uh, New York yeah. City. Um, well, I had known since I was uh, very young, probably 11 or 12 years old, my goal was uh, I wanted to graduate from high school and well I didn't have to graduate but who cares <laughs> the goal was to be in New York and uh, very naively say oh I just want to move to New York and be a working treble player having no idea what that meant what field what I would be involved in doing but uh, so when I was uh, in high school kind of just marking time and you know getting the bare minimum of grade point average to pass uh, I started to uh, realize uh, from other friends of mine who were a little older who had come to New York and started taking lessons with people. Uh, and I had, I had known Vince Penzarella before that because Vince and my father were at Curtis together back in the early 50s. Oh, so, wow, okay. Uh, I had known him a little bit and known of him, of course, his reputation. And I said, well, that's what I want to study with because it's not uh, just about what kind of style of music or kind of work I'm going to be doing. It's about just understanding the mechanics of why we do why what works works and Vince is such an amazing teacher and an amazing talent and someone who never pulled punches on what he thought about what you were doing uh, I think my favorite line that he ever gave me was you know Nick you are the most talented trumpet student I've ever had we're sitting here in a lesson and I'm like all right <laughs> And which immediately followed by, you are also the laziest person I've ever taught in my life. And just <laughs> air out of the balloon. But he was right and he was motivating me. <laughs> and uh, um, as a matter of fact, I didn't see him too long ago. I called him up and said, hey, Mr. Penzarelli, you know, can we, can we go out and, and just catch up and talk? Because, again, Vince, being from Philadelphia, has so much wealth of, of the history of that great town as well. And uh, again, he, he picks up where he left off. I hadn't seen him uh, in maybe eight years at that point. And he picks me up styling in the black tinted window Mercedes two-door. You know. Nice. So he picks me up. He, as, as I'm just about to open the door, he rolls the window down. And I was a lot heavier in my youth, as you remember. First words I've I have not seen this man in eight years. First words I've ever Ah, you're not fat anymore. <laughs> I said... <laughs> Hi, Mr. Penzrell. Thanks. Good to see you too. So you finally took my advice because at the end of our lessons, he'd always he lived on 84th and West End back then. He'd always open the door, and as I'm walking out with my case, he'd go, "Nick, remember, 
you walk by the McDonald's, not into it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So that was uh, Vince, all this to be said that he never pulled punches and was such a great inspiration as a teacher, as a man. Uh, we, we talked, as much as we played in lessons, we would talk about uh, music, uh, experiences, life, women. Mm. Yeah, leave it at that. Yes. Well, you do have a certain je ne sais quoi with the women I've noticed over the years. Oh. But, uh, and I mean that in the most positive of ways. Thank you. Of course. Yes, I'm you still know. paying alimony. Well, yeah. That, <coughs> I've heard of that happening. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, getting the producers. That must have been an exciting call. I know, I think John Miller was a big time, uh, great contractor here in New yeah. York. Uh, I think John was the contractor for that show. And uh, what was that like, like just when that uh, it was when that happened for you? Well, you know, it started with um, when I finally decided to move to New York. Uh, and uh, a couple of, of guys from Philly, great trumpet players and musicians said, oh, man, you know, because these were guys that um, went to college with at, uh, University of the Arts with PCPA back then or Temple. Uh, that knew Earl Gardner and Don Downs, uh, mm. Don who also studied with my dad, and said, give these guys a call, you know, just whatever, see if you can hang out or go to dinner, or take a lesson. So I did that, and um, I started, uh, had a few meetings with Don, and he asked to hear me play, and I played for him, and I was subbing occasionally on a band that Glenn Drews was in, and Glenn heard me play, and said, you should come watch, they were playing Fosse at the time. Okay. Uh, and they said, uh, Glenn said, why, why don't you come in and watch the book? I came in and watched the book, and then Don asked to hear me play, and we played, and then they offered me to come in and sub a few times. So I had subbed on, uh, it was Four Trumpet Show, and the fourth player, Glenn's book, you had to go play that uh, Harry James solo uh, from oh, the, right. the Sing Sing Sing, yeah. the Benny Goodman concert, uh, on stage. And I hadn't done that yet, nor had I played lead yet, subbing. And... Uh, Another friend of mine, uh, a trumpet player, um, John Chidova, was mm -hmm. playing lead on the road version of the show. Okay. And the lead player had to go on stage and play that solo. So um, John had to take a week off, and they were scrambling to find someone. And I never forget exactly, well, photographic memory, I guess. Here, I'm <laughs> pulling into, it's the, it's the summer, uh, and I'm pulling into uh, a some department store with my mom and my older sister. Cell phone rings. StarTech, as I remember. The old mm. StarTechs, I love them. Oh. So cell phone rings. Hello, Nick, this is John Miller. Okay, hi, how are you? I have <laughs> beautiful youth, ignorance, and innocence, I guess. I had no idea who he was, so. I said, okay, how are you? He says, um, yes, I know you're subbing at Fosse. I got your name from the guys playing there. Um, the tour is starting, uh, in two days in Hartford for a week. Can you go out and cover it? <laughs> this was the start of the my, my college semester. So I'm like, uh, I'll tell you what, can I think about it and give you a call back? Again, having no idea. <laughs> and I could almost tell uh, there was a, a slight change in John's voice. And he goes, oh, all right, yeah, you got an hour. Click. And I'm like, okay. And so here I am walking down the aisles pushing a cart for my mom. And my <laughs> I'm like, so what do you think? I mean, is it worth missing theory class for this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I called him back and said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. I drive up, do the rehearsal, and uh, I guess I did well enough. So on the drive back to New York after the week, I called up John, and I got his, uh, his voicemail. I said, you know, hey, John, thanks a lot for the call. It was a lot of fun. Um, hope you're well. I'll talk to you soon. And then I think it was within, within two or three hours, I was still driving back to New York. He called me up and said, hey, so... Uh, there's a show coming in, the producers, would you like to do it? And I said, okay. <laughs> so that, you know. You made quite an impression. Yes. <laughs> without, without question. Yes, an idiot, basically. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, it was uh, obviously the right thing to do was say yes, but um, it worked out very well. And then that was quite an experience just starting a show, whereas everyone around me was already a seasoned professional at not only being in town and, and working, but also playing shows. So here I am trying to act like I'm not wide-eyed and ask the stupidest question possible. I remember so well. I mean, uh, now you're 
uh, still a very, very young man, but a, a seasoned veteran, at, oh, even at that you. age. But uh, I remember uh, so uh, so many people talking like, what? Who, who is this guy? How did he get the show? You know, and, Black man. And, and clearly now we all know uh, the, the talent level uh, uh, was the Cheers umbrella over, <laughs> over everything. But... Uh, but uh, and you know what a, what a great show. I mean, for those of you who don't know, when you do a Broadway show in New York, it's it's always uh, it's 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 kind of the lifeblood of the work uh, scene in terms of the freelance work in New York. So we're all uh, very grateful and and uh, mm-hmm. eager and and happy to get the call to do these shows. And sometimes they uh, they might last a month or two, and uh, sometimes they might last a year or two. And a, once in a great while, you'll get one like the producers that'll last uh, five or six years. I think it lasts six years. Six yeah. years, yeah. And, and occasionally there'll be something like that's running now, like a Hamilton or Book of Mormon that you can see is going to run for a very long time. But that's uh, that's uh, uh, pretty rare that that happens. So that's very cool that uh, your yeah. first show was uh, was such a was such a big hit. Um, you know, let's let's kind of shift gears. It's something that I really have been anxious to talk to you about in this interview. But uh, it's the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. Um, yeah. You you. Uh, were were tapped by the band to to be the lead trumpet player in 2005, and mm-hmm. what an honor! I mean, the lineage of great uh, lead trumpet players that have gone through that band is uh, uh, incredible, to to say the yeah. least. Um, I know for those of you who haven't heard the Vanguard band uh, recently, go as soon as you possibly can, and whatever it costs you to get to hear this band, do it. I, I went. Uh, it's been a couple years now, and I feel like I should go. Uh, on a regular basis, this band it plays at such an incredibly high level, and it's inspiring from note one when you hear them. Uh, the ensemble playing is impeccable. Uh, of course, the music is uh, the arrangements are amazing. The soloists are world class. It's uh, yeah. second to no other ensemble anywhere in the world, and uh, certainly one of uh, one of our crown jewels in terms of the New York. Uh, jazz scene, uh, and all due respect to the other incredible bands, Maria Schneider and all the other bands in, in New York that uh, do put out such an amazing uh, product. To, I hate to use that word, referring to an artistic endeavor. But, uh, but at any rate, um, talk to us about that. I know, in, because of our friendship, I know that you have uh, said to me many times how that was the band that you really wanted to play with. Mm-hmm. And when I hear you play with that band, it sounds like if Thad was alive today, you would be the lead trumpet player. It's just it's such a fit. Oh, it's such an incredible you. fit. But um, maybe just talk about, um, and I'll kind of throw some things out. Sure. It's, it's such a wide question, I know. But but um, talk about start playing with that band, what you guys are doing now, Thad, the lineage of lead trumpet players. Just kind of wherever you want to go with your sure. thoughts about the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. Well, I'll tell you, um, I have to start a little bit sooner. Uh, it, it is a story I've told many times, and it's, uh, it's totally true, of course, but, you know, when you're a kid, uh, and Christmas comes, and you can't wait, you know. Uh, so here I am uh, about to open my Christmas gifts, and we had to wait, you know, until the parents <laughs> got up. I ruined that tradition several years earlier, so now it was you had to wait. And uh, I think I was, was third grade. And so I start opening up stuff that I think looks like video games or a G.I. Joe, whatever. Uh, it's a Walkman. Okay. Cassette. Uh, Clifford Brown, Max Roach went to. Mm. Okay. Uh, Chet Baker with strings. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dizzy Gillespie, big band, grooving high. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds funny. My dad's standing over me, of course, you know, like thinking, right, I'm going to get it and be like, oh, this is him. And I just look at him, I'm like, <laughs> what is this? I was hoping for an Eagles uniform. <laughs> right. Yeah. Where's my Randall Cunningham jersey? <laughs> so, and, I, and all he said was, he goes, look, listen to it. You're either going to like it, you're going to hate it. What's the worst that can happen? So needless to say, of course, I listened to it and became enamored with all three of those trumpet players and then the big band thing. And then he started steadily feeding me more big band records and more small group records, various guys. My dad was a huge Dexter Gordon fan, as I mm-hmm. am. Uh, but so it wasn't what I started doing was the the meager uh, allowance I would get was starting by you know go to whatever record store and just see cassettes and just look for big band and uh, even though I wasn't always sure what I was buying, it was still big band. So you know you're a kid. I wasn't really hip to Woody yet or Buddy or Thad and Mel or Basie. 
I'd heard the names in abstract as guys would talk about them around me, the older professionals, but I hadn't experienced it, so I started experiencing it. And then, really, the man I have to credit now uh, was my eighth grade band director, who um, is a trumpet player as well, retired now, lucky. <laughs> uh, but he had at school, uh, our, his room, his office was in the basement below the auditorium, and you'd walk in and there'd be easily 300 CDs there. And that was just mm. the stuff that he brought from home. He was, mm. he was a great listener. And once he, I guess, saw how interested I was in it, started giving me records. And he was the first person who ever gave me a Thad and Mel record. Oh, wow. And I heard it, and it was unlike anything I ever heard before. And I went, that's it. And I was like, where, where are they from? What do they do? And he explained the whole thing. And he owned... Uh, at the, it had just come out, I think, in the 90, mid-90s, uh, the solid state, the complete solid state recordings. And he just went, I'm trusting you with this. Do not. You know, I'm like, okay, I promise, I promise. I went home, and man, over a weekend, I drove everybody in the house nuts. I just was cranking it and just trying to, that was the first time I started trying to figure out the lead parts. And first time I had really uh, started saying, you know, Snooky Young, Jimmy Nottingham, you know, all these players and of course the writers you know Thad and Brooke Meyer and Garnett Brown and so I just became enamored with it and then once I knew that the band was still in existence and it was that this was even though I said my main goal was to move to New York and make a living my life goal at that point from the time I was in eighth grade on was I want to play in that band mm. having no idea that it would actually come to fruition at, mm -hmm. at a certain point so I move up here and I you know it was going down every Monday, you know. It was like, Earl, hi, Earl, <laughs> hey. Hi. And one day, I just, he just said, hey, uh, you want to sub in the band? And I, you know, um, was glad I didn't, you know, pass out or something. I was like, yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> so I started subbing uh, initially on third and then played second. And then uh, after a little while, I started subbing on lead. But I was so familiar with the music by that point, And I had the majority of all the recordings, the, the great recordings of Central Park North, that record, uh, Sweet for Pops, the stuff that I could physically play when I was younger, I had memorized. You know, I used to play along with the It was one of my big things. And kids, play along with records. I cannot stress that enough. Play <laughs> along with records. Uh, and that's what I was doing when I was home. And so I moved up. And even though, of course, the style of the band had changed, uh, at least I had a pretty solid foundation of I knew when I was supposed to come in at least and I knew what the notes were and and the spirit of the band from the beginning so and of course hearing the band I would go down I would try to go down almost every Monday if I could for months and just hear it so what a great uh, also a great lesson for for all of us but for young folks especially like perseverance I mean that's that's a big thing and uh, and you know uh just to talk a little, to, to me like that, I mean, I'm such a fan of so many writers and uh, Bob Mincer comes to the top of my list who has been so yeah. inspirational to me. And I think Bob would, not to put words in his mouth, but I think he would say that Thad was a tremendous influence on him. I think he influenced all of the, the great modern big man writers, you know, and, yeah. and um, what was very interesting, our, our great videographer, Kent Smith, who's also a great trumpet player uh, and uh, contributed trumpet playing and, uh, and, uh, and video work to our uh, Hip Bone Big Band CD, was telling uh, me a couple weeks ago about the story about how uh, the Thad and Mel band came to being and the fact that, that Count Basie had rejected uh, the charts that Thad had written for Count Basie's band. So maybe you could just kind of talk about that a little bit sure. and maybe segue into, you know, Thad being just such a seminal writer for, I mean, he really brought hard bop into the in that language and that harmonic vocabulary into to the big band from yeah. the small group and maybe you could just kind of express ideas about sure. both of those things well yeah uh, so what happened was and thad had written charts for basie um uh up to that point he wrote uh, a great blues called the deacon he wrote uh for their performance uh when they played in london for the queen uh HMS, I believe is what, mm. Her Majesty, mm -hmm. I think it's HMS, or maybe I'm just quoting, uh, you know, ships at this point, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but he he had written several charts for the band, and then Basie had commissioned him to say, write a record 
for the band. So that is where the story begins, is he wrote these tunes and they rehearsed them, and Basie basically said, man, these tunes are great. It's just not the sound of, the, of my band. So keep them, and quite frankly, you should consider starting your own band. And 50 years later, you know, here we are. Incredible. But those tunes were Big Dipper, Low Down. Uh, I believe Backbone was one. I think of That's Freedom, mm. the Hank Jones tune that he ended up arranging uh, was one. I, I just wrote it, and that was that. Incre what an um, incredible story, yeah. And, you know, he met Mel. Uh, also, there's a great book that Kent and I were talking about, uh, A View from the Back of the Band, that Chris Smith, who subs, uh, sub drummer in the band, wrote, and it really chronicles Mel's life, but one of the things it talks about is how they met, which was Thad was with Basie, and Mel was playing drums with Stan, and they kind of ran into each other, and they really admired each other and dug each other and said, oh, yeah, if we're ever, you know, living in the same place, you know, we should start a band. I mean, how random is that in the late 50s? And then fast forward several years, they're both living in New York, and boom. They put together an all-star band. Yeah. Um, the second half of your question, which was what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say this. Like, um, when I heard the band a couple years ago, uh, I was just blown away by how great the ensemble sounded i mean the solos are so great i mean i could sit there for a yeah. year and not get tired i mean it's just you got yeah. richie perry and scott one holding dick oats and terrell and uh and everybody i mean yeah. and the trombone so it's just like it's just world class every every aspect of it but the uh the ensemble playing is so great and you guys are still playing all those classic thad charts mm -hmm. and they sound as fresh today as they ever have you know and it, yeah. to me like I was just curi really curious as to you as being the lead trumpet player, the lead voice in the ensemble. Um, what's your perspective on that writing and how, how just kind of how it's, you know, uh, not only has it remained viable, it's still like a total inspiration to everybody who wants to write for a big man and, and totally. listens to a big man. Well, actually, that two things just popped in my head before I even kind of really delve into that question. One time it was a conversation. Uh, after the second set, I was having with Jim McNeely, our great pianist and composer in residence. And Jim started in the band in 78 uh, with Thad and Mel and then played for several years and then left the band for a little bit and then came back. Uh, and Jim has written two records for the band as well as some other compositions here and there. But I remember Jim saying this to me is he said when uh, he started writing uh, and he said, even more than that, he said the first time, he, Jim said, this is actually very funny, the reason that he wanted to move to New York was he was living in Chicago where he grew up, and he's driving this car, he's got the radio on, and Don't Get Sassy comes on. <laughs> and Jim said, it was just amazing, and he's listening to it, and he goes, New York seems like a pretty fun place, I think I should move there. <laughs> like, that's the, you know, so yeah. that's the reason Jim came. But Jim said this very uh, poignant thing, I think. Jim said, once... Thad and Mel came out and you started to hear Thad's writing. He said, you had to make a very conscious choice. He said, he, Thad was so influential. You either had to go with it or you just had to literally completely ignore it and stop listening to his compositions mm. if you wanted to try to truly find your own voice because it was so pervasive. Mm. Not to say, of course, there were other great writers. Uh, I love Bill Finnegan. I love Brooke Meyer. Uh, but of course, yeah. I thought it was a very poignant statement by, yeah. by Jim. Um, and also, um, yes, I know Bob loved, uh, probably still does love, I, like you said, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but Thad's music. And we still play, Bob wrote a record for the band, the music of Herbie Hancock, that was reported live at Montreux Jazz Festival, probably, mm. I think it was 1980, mm. 81 maybe. Um, we still play a lot of those compositions, mm -hmm. they're great. Yeah. But you can, you can hear a little bit of the influence, you know, just, it was so pervasive, it was so great. Um, you know, play and lead in that music is so, I mean, I'm honored to have uh, Dick Oates play lead alto and, and getting to play with Dick all the time. Yeah, the best, um, no question. I mean, for yeah. my money, the best lead alto player, period. Ever, yeah, I would agree. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he said, we, we were doing a clinic one time with the band, and he said, uh, it was, oh yeah, you know, and 
playing with Nick, you know, we lock up so well together on the mic. We lock up so well together, and it's just such a pleasure to play with him. And I'm sitting there going, sorry? <laughs> so then it was my turn to talk, and it was very truthful of me. And I said, well, I said, yes, uh, I would agree with Dick. You know, we lock up so well. The reason for that is it's because I've pretty much stolen all of his stuff. <laughs> and people laughed, and I was like, no, I'm, I'm serious. You know, I, I often say, and this applies to this music, um, my five biggest influences on, of lead trumpet playing uh, over the years, only two of them are trumpet players. There's Snooky Young, of course, and there's Al Porcino, for different reasons, which we can go into later if you like. There's Sinatra, mm. the old man who you worked with quite extensively, Sarah Vaughan, mm. and Dick Oates. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good quintet right there. And, I, you dig? <laughs> and, and the reason I, I'm sure some people are kind of maybe questioning why I would name a lead alto player is one of my biggest influences. But we all have, um, each instrument, right, has our, our natural tendencies. Um, sax players will tend to scoop into a note instead of just attack it head mm -hmm. on sometimes. Hey! Um, <laughs> bone players can have the end. No offense. <laughs> You know, the, 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 that kind of stuff. And trouble players can... Wait, what? Just be, I don't know. <laughs> you know it's called Panko. Uh, <laughs> and trouble players can just, well, be lunkheads. But no, we have our stylistic things that we do because it lends itself to the instrument. So part of the thing that I really started to, to try to teach myself was I'm playing with Dick and I'm hearing him do these things that are very saxophonistic that I loved, how they would sound mm. on top of a sax solo or just in the section playing lead. I said, man, I, I don't hear trumpet players do that. I want to learn how to do that. So I just sat at home and drove everybody nuts and tried to figure <laughs> out how to do this stuff. And that's why his natural phrasing, and the reason I say Frank and, and Sarah, and also Alan and Snooky, but just it's so natural. It's so singing. Um, Vince Penzarella and my father used to say this all the time. Um, they would listen to singers. They were forced to listen to singers growing up. So in addition to all the great music I heard, I was listening to singers growing up, not only jazz, but in the operatic scene as well. And I was forced to uh, solfege the Pasquale Bona book before I was allowed to play the trumpet because it was about singing and having this trumpet or this brass instrument in our hand, but we're singing through it. We're not letting the instrument dictate what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to playing Thad's music, we're talking about someone who's writing from the perspective of a great jazz player, uh, a great writer, the harmonic and bebop knowledge, like you said, bringing that to that vein. But also, Thad heard very out lines. When mm -hmm. he soloed, his lines were great, but a little different than anybody before him and quite frankly anybody since and he wrote like that so to execute his lines and I hate to use the word execute to play the music you really have to not only have an understanding in my opinion of where he came from and how he heard I own all those small group records uh, listening to those records and hearing where he came from I mean th that's how he's writing for the band so to understand that you want to have, even though it's harmonically dense and difficult and angular, you need to make it seem like it's just flowing mm -hmm. out of you. That, to me, is one of the greatest challenges. Mm. Wow, that was like sorry, that was a, an incredible answer. No, like that was so. Uh, there's so much great advice like, to be pulled from that. That was uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fantastic. I'm, my head's hurting, so excuse yeah. me for yeah, a moment. Please yeah, please do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, ah. One of your other, I mean, you've worked with so many people, but certainly another uh, incredible artist that you're uh, uh, widely associated with is Can a lady. Can I interrupt you for a moment? I'm sorry, yes. actually, because I didn't answer your question fully. I mean, yeah, I'm we, sure. We'll yeah, edit sure. that out, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, uh, is, Mike, you were talking about the, the lineage of the band. This is one of those bands there's been so few turnover, and, and part of also why it's incredibly humbling for me um, you look at the lead alto chair, there's been Jerome Richardson, Jerry Dodgen, and Dick Oates. <laughs> Three lead alto For players 50 in years. 50 years. It's good to... Trumpet. Um, of course, the records vary because 
back in the day when there were uh, there's more record dates. Maybe you could make it, maybe you couldn't make it, blah, blah, blah. But really, there's been, with very few exceptions, Snooky Young, Al Porcino, John Faddis, Earl Gardner, and me. Right. Five right. guys in 50 years. Yeah. Um, also, very good retention. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mel Lewis, and then when Mel passed, um, Dennis McCrell, the great Dennis McCrell, who we just worked with. So awesome, yeah. I love uh, Danny D'Imperio did it for a little bit, and then John Riley, four mm -hmm. drummers in 50. I mean, yeah. it's the band, part of the reason I think the sound of the band has remained so unique and so consistent is that the personnel has remained so unique and mm -hmm. consistent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and not to ignore our trombone brethren, but John Mosca has been uh, Who? Held, no. <laughs> held the position for, for years and years. I mean, he dates back to the, the Thad era. Yes. No. Uh, uh, you, Douglas Provence, had, of course, a great big, great bass trombonist. So you've had, you've had John time. Mosca since 1975. Douglas joined in 77. Uh, you need to bone up on your details a little bit, if I, yeah, if I can well, say so. It's like, here, I'll bone up right now. <laughs> Well, let's let's totally shift gears and talk about uh, the late great Prince. Um, I still, it's like uh, I, I I was always a fan of the music. I wasn't like a rabid fan, but I th to see him perform was one of the most amazing things. And uh, um, sadly, we lost him this year. Uh, I was I was sitting in the in Phil Magnati's studio mixing our Hip Bone Big Band CD and uh, came on CNN, which we had on all the time yeah. to just keep our mind in something <laughs> else and. Uh, said he passed away, I was just like, how can that possibly be? Um, and sadly, he's gone. He, his contribution to music is like Mozart. I mean, it's yeah. like unbelievable. Um, can you talk about just your experience with him? What, uh, what he obviously it meant a lot to you to play with him, but I'm, I'm sure it meant a lot to him that he had you in, in, in the band. But um, what are your kind of lasting memories of, uh, of him as a musician and as a person? Um, the whole experience, and I mean this in the truest sense of the form, was amazing. And there would be several times I would use the word wow mm -hmm. <laughs> in every context you could possibly use it in. But it was genuinely an experience. It, it came to pass by um, a friend of mine and a great uh, writer and trumpet player, uh, Phil Lasseter. Phil... Um, writes a lot and arranges a lot for um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, rhythm and blues artists, uh, gospel artists, and he's a great writer. Um, and when Phil moved to New York, which was maybe six years ago, he called up a mutual friend of ours, Michael League, who's the guy who uh, is the bass player and, and the leader of Snarky Puppy, that great mm -hmm. band. Sure. And said, hey, uh, you know, I need to record some lead trumpet players on these tracks. Do you know anybody in New York? And Mike said, me. So that's how Phil and I got to know each other. And then uh, so he started using me to record these tracks. And Prince, who was very eclectic musically and always listening, mm. just like they say, and it is true, he was writing every day. He was listening every day, trying to find different anything. Mm. And so he heard some tracks and said, man, these horn tracks are great who wrote them, and he found out, he got Phil's contact info, he called Phil and said, I want you to put together a horn section. Uh, and Phil called me and said, would you like to do it? And I, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Let me think no, sorry, I, I'm unavailable. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I said yes, and actually Prince then had the idea that he saw a video of the horn section Phil put together playing, and he really liked that, and he saw another horn section that he really liked. And he just went as only he can, so why don't we just have two horn sessions? So that's why there was 11 horns on that band. And it was amazing, because then, now we're talking about, and the, the horn section was uh, five saxes, four trumpets, sorry, two bones, but you know. No gig is perfect. Uh, and- um, Bass trombone? No. Oh, okay. No, we're good, we had two okay. berries, you know, we just, you know. Oh, oh, wow, okay. Haven't played the same note and that tune anyway, so it's perfect. <laughs> So uh, when we, we first went, I'll never forget this, because we get called, uh, it was August of 2012. I was playing um, Porgy and Bess at the time. Uh, and uh, they said, hey, can you come out for a week 
next week. Like, we just want to do some preliminary rehearsals. So, yeah, sure, it'd be great. So we all get together, the horns are figuring stuff out. Yeah, well, that week turned into three and a half weeks, which was my first introduction to the free flowedness of Prince. <laughs> um, and, you know, the first time we met him was hilarious. Um, I digress, and feel free to cut this out later. <laughs> but so uh, the lead trombone player, Roy Agee, who's a dear friend and a great player. Absolutely, yeah. uh, we were rehearsing in, I love it, the Blue Room at Paisley Park. It was blue because the carpet was blue and the walls were blue. And this was the most comfortable carpet I've ever stood on in my life. It was unbelievable. I felt bad blowing my spit on it. <laughs> but I did. And Stay so, true to yourself. I like that. Well, <laughs> I'm a classy guy. So we agreed. The horns were just rehearsing arrangements for some of the classic tunes, 1999, uh, DM. Uh, what was it, uh, DMSR, medley, and all these kinds of things. And, hey guys, let's take 10. So, Roy needed to use the restroom, but he didn't necessarily know where he was going. <laughs> Paisley Park. So here we are. This is Paisley Park. And instead of making a right and heading towards the restrooms... Oh, and by the way, when you walked into Paisley Park, there was the motorcycle from, little, from, uh, from Purple Rain, the video. Like, there it was. Uh, with the wow. key in the ignition, so I'm an adult. I didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, but so Roy made a left down the hallway, and apparently it's dark. Uh, fast forward, 20 minutes go by. We're all waiting for Roy. Like, where did this guy go? Maybe, maybe he's not feeling well. Or something. He comes back in with this look on his face that is denoted something not good happened. <laughs> I said, Roy, what happened? He goes, uh, I just found Prince. We had not met Prince yet at this point. Okay. So what do you mean he's found Prince? Well, there was a little breakfast station, and he opened, he went down a dark corridor, opened a door, the light's on, CNN is on, and there's Prince in his pajamas eating some cereal. <laughs> and Roy says, Roy says, he doesn't, he goes, I'm just frozen. And I go, howdy, Mr. Prince. <laughs> Prince apparently just laughed and was like, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. You watching the news? <laughs> yes, I'm watching the news. I like news. Like he was just, you know, so stunned that this was happening. He didn't know what to do, which I wouldn't either. Yeah. And so Roy said, Prince is looking at me and goes, you guys sound good. I'll be down to hear you in a little while. <laughs> I.e., so, and scrape. So that's why it took him all this time and he came back and he was just like, I, I just, and he said, he goes, well, it's been a pleasure working with you guys. I think I'm fired. <laughs> you know? So Prince comes and we start rehearsing and just from the, the very first moment, it was amazing. I mean, the man was of course talented, but he heard everything. Mm. And he knew so specifically what he wanted with the music. Um, he could for lack of a better term, punch stuff up immediately. Like, we'd, we'd be in rehearsal, we'd be arranging stuff, and the horns would play it, and then he'd come up, and he'd say, horns, you know what, why don't we try that? And he would go to the keyboard, and he would play a certain voicing and a certain rhythm that was just slightly different, but it made it kick that much more. And he would go to the first guitar, and he would say, no, just give me the guitar, it's easier for me to, and he would do it, and they'd go, oh, okay, second guitar, hmm, bass, hmm, keyboards, hmm, and he would literally change. Wow. All of it right there. And he goes, all right, let me just hear that real quick. Three, four. And you play it, and it was just amazing. All these little wow. minute changes that he heard, it just made it elevated to the next level. It was so inspiring. That is, so amazing. That is uh, beyond incredible. I mean, you know, it's funny, like, as us uh, nowadays, especially with classical musicians, there's, oh, there's no Mozarts and, you know, these are the Mozarts, you know, yeah. the, the, the princes of the world. And, and there are very few that are in the pop music world, but occasionally they come along that are obviously older than Prince. But Stevie Wonder is another one that oh, has yeah. that kind of same, they're just hearing the entire thing, just like just like Mozart did and uh, Bruckner did. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, it's, and, 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 of course, that was popular music of its day. So uh, yeah. uh, important to kind of uh, 
to note that. But, but thanks for sharing the story about Roy. That is hysterical. Oh, it's like I can imagine the, uh, the the terror that was in his mind. Like, could oh. he see his prints for the first time? Oh, man. It's a, you know, I, <laughs> something else that you and I joke about all the time, I mean, the first time that we had an alone moment, um, it wasn't really meant to be an alone moment. <laughs> but I'm turning the corner at Paisley just being me, and it's, you know, like this acting like a child. And I just turn the corner coming out of the restroom, and here comes the corner. I'm just, just about to make the left, and I just go, ah! <laughs> and as I'm turning, there's Prince right in front of me. He just goes, hi, Prince. And all of a sudden, I'm whispering. I'm like, hi, Prince. And so I, I just have to, uh, excuse me. And it's like, ran away, you know. And he just started laughing, like, you know. Well, that's nice first idea. interaction. And, uh, well, at least you hadn't uh, predict the can. I, but let's move on. From let's that. move yeah. on from that. Yeah. Um, it's been a while. Let's talk about... Uh, some some of the more you know it was great to like get your insight on both these two you know very very uh, cornerstone gigs in your career both both the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra and and Prince. Let's talk about some of the things that you look for as a lead player. I want to ask you a few different questions, but um, in particular, and it doesn't have to be a long thought, but and I know you'll be uh, very direct about it. But what do you look for? I mean, you play with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. You play with. Terrell Stafford, you play with Scott Wenholt, two of the greatest musicians who ever played a trumpet. Yeah. Great at whatever they pick up to do, but they're certainly two of the greatest section players in addition to being world-class solos. You get to play with these guys regularly, but what do you look for in a section player that's playing for you for the first time? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I will say this, I think part of the reason that, well, I mean, I can't espouse the great qualities of Terrell and Scott enough. One of the first qualities that comes to mind though is selflessness. Hmm. Here are two great musicians and great jazz players playing third and fourth trumpet in a big band. And they give it to me. And when I say that, I mean they support me volume wise, pitch wise, style wise, the color of your sound. Um, they support all of this. They're, they're very giving. I know I've experienced in my career, and thankfully not a lot, but guys that they're jazz players and that's their focus. So when they're not soloing, they just, they don't really want to be involved in the ensemble. Right. Whereas these two guys, it's almost more important to them. Well, actually that's a lot. It is more important to them to be involved in the ensemble and make sure the ensemble sounds good as a whole. And then when they get their moment, mm. they do what they do, which is amazing. Right. Um, what I look for is innate musicianship. I want you to keep your ears open at all times. Um, I'll have um, subs to any big band or, or situation I, I play in. If I'm playing lead, and they'll look at a phrase and they'll say, "Oh, is that off on four? Is that off on one? Or is it, like, what are you doing there?" and I'm not trying to vibe them. I'm not trying to make them feel bad. But I just look at them and I say, you'll hear it. <laughs> because I really mean that. When I say, like, to me, like, if, if you write uh, the minus sign four, off on four, most people are going to approach that note and they're going to tongue stop it or they're going to crescendo into it or something like that. I don't want that. I want guys that are going to have their ears open to hear are we breath releasing this? Are we crescendoing? Are we decrescendoing? Is there a little vibrato possibly? Ears. Ears always open. In my, as far as a sound concept for a section, um, ideally I want color. I want a vast range of color. I don't want, I tend to have a brighter sound. I don't want three other guys with brighter sounds. What I would generally enjoy is the second trumpet player to have a brighter sound or certainly be able to cap be capable of having that brighter sound. And the third and the fourth guys, I want a more mid-range to almost dark sound so that you're getting this overtone palette, especially in the different registers we're going to play in. So um, what I love about Scott and Terrell, if we're going to use the Vanguard band as an example, and uh, Tanya Darby on second trumpet, Tanya has a great sound and, and is similar to mine, and Scott and Terrell can color their sounds in various ways. But generally, they're more mid-range and really thick, beautiful sounds so that basically it makes my tea kettle sound sound a little less tea kettle-y. <laughs> I don't think I would describe your sound as tea kettle, but 
Thanks. To each his own. Um, that's great advice, and it's. I hope. Uh, I hope all of, uh, especially the younger players out there, uh, heed that advice because I think uh, a lead player, the quality of uh, Nick Marchione, is, is definitely looking for a certain something from from the players around them. And it's yeah. as it's, you just described, you're playing with the best of the best, so um, you're used to that and you're expecting that. Okay, now just uh, putting the uh, shoe on the other foot. Now. You, Typically, you're the lead player, but I've heard you sound phenomenal playing second and third trumpet. Sometimes in New York, you'll be, you know, we've got other great lead trumpet players. Tony sure, Cadlick, yeah. of course, comes to mind. Jim Hines, you mentioned John Chidoba, the various folks that uh, did do a Don Down do a fantastic job. But I know, I know you've worked a lot with Tony. Whenever I hear you playing in the section with Tony, uh, it just sounds fantastic. You're both incredible players. Well, of course, it's a great uh, match, but. What do you uh, look for in a lead player when you're playing when you're playing second or third trumpet? Um, <laughs> well, let's start with some of the guys you mentioned. I mean, uh, yes, Tony and I play together a lot, and we hook up very well together. But when I'm playing under Tony, and we've played enough together now, I know what he likes. Mm. I know what he likes in the color of a sound, volume-wise, everything. But... Um, even still with Tony, I will ask, we'll play one or two tunes, and I'll just look over and say, is it cool? Do you need something from me that I'm not give, doing, or should I do something less? And I think that's very important. It's, you know, when, when, you, uh, when you're playing an ensemble, especially if you're not playing lead in any section, you have to check your ego at the door. Hmm. And as you know, in this town, You'll play lead on a bunch of dates, and then all of a sudden you'll be under maybe the great, you know, Keith O'Quinn or Larry Farrell or somebody like that. You have to check your ego. Maybe, and I'm not saying those guys, but in anywhere in the world and in any situation, you might play with somebody who plays great. They're not going to play it how you play it, would necessarily hear it on lead, but that's not your call at this point. Mm -hmm. You need to make that person feel comfortable. And... That's what I do. Even though I've played with Jim, uh, Jim Hines a bunch, or John Chidoba, or Bob Milliken, the great Bob. Of Milliken. course, yeah. Uh, but I should have mentioned him no. straight up. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, I'll always ask them: am, am I giving you what you need, or should I change? Because it's not about me; it's about the ensemble. Your job as a section player is to not only make the lead player feel comfortable, in my opinion, but enhance the sound of the ensemble. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, I just always ask the guys, what do you need? What am I doing? What am I not doing? And sometimes, it could be a, a variety of things. It could be a color of sound. It could be pitch. It could be time. It could be you're playing a little too loud, a little too soft, whatever it is. But personally, and this is uh, the way I grew up, because I grew up with the older school cats, they were not afraid, just like I said about Vince Pensarella, uh, I got to play, I was very lucky enough to play some gigs with the great Johnny Bellow. And I love this, actually. I was mortified at the time, but now I really dig it. And rest <laughs> in peace, I wish he was still alive so I could give him a hug and just say, I'm so sorry. And for those of you who don't know Johnny Bellow, and I know his name because of you, and you telling me stories, but one of the, one of the great uh, Philadelphia lead trumpet players and yes. did all the recording work, and not to cut you off, no, but, no. but just for it, I, I was enlightened by, by uh, your knowledge about Johnny Bellow. But, uh, just so yeah, Johnny, knows between is. Philadelphia and Atlantic City, and also he lived in New York in the 50s. He's, um, he's part of that great section, uh, the Ted McNabb and Company uh, record from the 50s. It's Bernie Glow and him. Uh, Irby, mm. uh, it's, it's a great band. Ollie Johnson, I believe, is playing drums. It's a great band, but um, he was also Judy Garland's lead trumpet player for several years. But so fast forward, so here I am, seventeen years old, and <laughs> playing third trumpet. And he called everybody Babe. That was the thing. He would say your name, Mike Babe. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, three tunes go by, and we're you know it's a society date. We're wearing tuxes, and uh. He, he says, Nick, babe, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, Johnny, I hear you great. Sounds great. You know, I'm like a little kid. You know, it sounds great. He goes, okay, so you can hear me. Says, yeah. He goes, okay, well, if you can hear me, I'm just curious why the aren't you with me? And I was like, 
Uh, and then all I hear is two, three, four, next. <laughs> and I was so freaked out, but it was great because it was that directness that I grew up with that I actually really appreciate if I'm playing under a lead player. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you need. Yeah. It's, you know, this is my job. But I loved that, I mean, it was a little biting, of course, but I love that story <laughs> because he was just saying, you are not giving me what you should be giving me. Do this. Yeah. I loved it. Wow, that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, I think, it, again, you know, for, for all of us, it, it's not a matter of uh, youth or age or whatever, but so important. I mean, for a player of your stature to be approaching playing in the section like that, that's exactly what it's got to be. And that's what yeah. makes the thing work good, whether you're, you know, typically you're playing lead, but whether you're playing in the section or not. And, and uh, you know, I would say the same thing about the guys, especially Tony, we mentioned, they would approach it the exact same way. So... For, especially for younger trumpet players coming up now, so important to uh, to kind of look at that in, in the, with those eyes I mean, and ears, more importantly. Yeah. I remember doing a date really quick, just yeah. slowly. I played fourth trumpet, and it was one of the, the... The joy that I felt and the satisfaction I got was equal to... It was Bob, Tony, Jim Hines, and me. I'm playing fourth. You, Keith, Birch, and George Flynn. And I was just playing fourth, and we hear the playback, and I, I thought I was doing my job, you know, just as I should. And I, I, the satisfaction I got from hearing that back and playing with you guys in the moment was every bit as great as playing lead trumpet. To me, the satisfaction is in, in the section is what making, lifting the entire ensemble. It's not, can I hear myself enough in the mix, or, right. you know, right. are cats digging me playing fourth trumpet? I mean... Absolutely. Great. Well, let's shift gears a little bit to something uh, utterly interesting, the cha, which uh, I'm not familiar as, a, with that. as I mentioned in the intro, uh, some of you may be wondering why we have a <coughs> bottle of Smirnoff uh, behind us, but uh, Nick and I, mostly Nick, I simply ah! did, the, did the introduction, but uh, we did a video many years ago, and if you go to the Hippo Music website, scroll down to the bottom of the homepage, you'll see a uh, the, uh, a link to the art of the cha, and uh, Nick gives his uh, a lesson and a uh, and a, a bit of a historical retrospective, if you will, on the cha itself. Uh, in that video, we had uh, a bottle of Smirnoff there, and since then we've had uh, many uh, uh, purveyors and uh, makers of spirits vie for your uh, services uh, from an endorsement standpoint, and currently we're. Well, negotiations yes. with Smirnoff, but uh, of course we welcome others. Kettle One, I need Grey a big Goose signing and so bonus. forth. But uh, yes, oh, needless to say, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yes, let's put that out there. Um, at any rate, uh, we've had a lot of fun with the art of the cha. Uh, there has been, uh, I, I guess, you'd have to say, if you're going to talk about the cha, you'd have to talk about Conrad Gazzo and Maynard Ferguson mm -hmm. as guys who have uh, kind of. And we're doing this tongue in cheek, but it's a it's a lot of fun. And uh, and you have uh, you've done it on national television. Let's see, I I was sitting right next to you when you did it on the uh, Tony the broadcast of the Tony Awards oh, in 2010. Do what I can. You also did I believe on the David Letterman show with uh, the uh, uh, How to Succeed how to in Business. Succeed. Also and, on the Tony Awards the following year with How to Succeed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so you've you've done one. everything you can to bring it to the national consciousness. Huh. Uh, talk about the cha for a second and uh, where that comes from. Well. <laughs> Well, yes, it comes, in all seriousness, it's funny, you know, uh, we had a lot of fun with it. I still have fun with it, but it's very much a serious um, historical thing for lead trumpet players, right? Uh, it lost traction, I think, maybe into the early 60s, because there's some great recordings, uh, Al Porcino with the Terry Gibbs band with Mel Lewis, mm -hmm. uh, and you hear a few on some of those live records. We kind of lost, um, I hate to say popularity, because let's be honest, <laughs> but uh, much like Lee Trumbull players think of style now as, or even then, as doits or kiss-offs or uh, um, sometimes you'll see the squealy line down to a note and you'll hear somebody go, Goo -doo -da -e -ha! that's a stylistic choice. Not one that I would choose, but that's a stylistic choice. Um, but it was a stylistic choice. Now, 
uh, because it isn't as prevalently used. I mean, when I started using it, yes, it's funny, and but I think it's it's a very actually it's a very personally stylized thing. Gazzo did it; he did it a lot. You can hear it on the Sinatra records, some Dean Martin records, any of the uh, the studio dates that he was playing lead on in the fifties. You you can hear it occasionally, and it was always, in my opinion appropriate for that era of music. I said that with a straight face, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Scott Wenholt loves it. I think my, my well, that, I, th I don't know, I can't remember if I actually told this exact story on when we actually did the video, but um, when we started How to Succeed in business with Daniel Radcliffe in 2011, um, it was a great band, and it was orchestrated. It was all swinging, and it was orchestrated by Doug Besterman, uh, and it was uh, very much a Marty Page deck, deck tet vibe. And uh, it was um, very, very swinging in that vein. And Scott said to me in the first rehearsal, "You're not going to do that release thing, are you?" <laughs> and I just looked at him. And I went. Oh, yes. And so my joke with him was I said, Scott, you, you know, when you were listening to Freddie and Woody and shedding the changes on all these great tunes in high school and college, I was sitting there playing major scales with a cha at the end of each one. <laughs> so, you know, you studied music. I studied the history of interesting releases for lead trumpet players. But I think it's Equally a, valid. I just think it's a it's something that should come back a little bit more when used properly. Yes. But yes, Gazzo yeah. was, uh, as far as lead trumpet in big band and in recording, he was kind of the purveyor of that. Maynard had a great one that was used a lot sometimes in the melodies that he would play in front of his band or just even on solos, which I also really <laughs> dug. You know. A good cha is better than... I, I can't even finish that sentence, actually, yeah. but it's good. Yeah. You can only do so much with, like, you know, Woody uh, harmonics and, you know, Freddie Hubbard approach to harmony. You know, but yeah, no. a good shot. Can I mean, really that stuff gets bring old, into the but, house. You know. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I used to play Charles on Prince's band. And I'm sure he liked yeah. it, right? I got a look one time. Yeah. But I wasn't fired, so that was a good sign. If, if I can share, I mean, my favorite look has to be Kenny Seymour, who's a great uh, orchestrator, conductor, pianist. He was the music director of uh, Memphis and was so kind to us. I mean, he's to, great. to say he, he gave us a, a long leash would be, he was the best. Would be uh, probably somewhat of an understatement. But at any rate, uh, Nick had this thing where he would do the cha, and there was something going on on stage with uh, John Eric, right? John he Eric. Had a role, one of the actors who's great, and, uh, and he would end the tune, and then the band would cut off, and then all of a sudden you'd just hear this cha about two or three seconds later and I'll never forget when you you kind of kept pushing the envelope and it would be instead of a second it'd be two seconds and then three and then four seconds yeah. and Kenny was such a kind gentleman to us and uh, gave us uh, gave, he really gave us a lot of uh, space to have a lot of fun and, and he knew that we were going to be professional and do a good job but when you pushed it to the farthest limit I remember we all we were all on stage so we wouldn't actually be looking directly at the conductor and Kenny would be in the middle of the band so we'd have a video screen for each one like little personal videos and I remember hearing the cha like f three or four seconds after the whole band had stopped and I just remember Kenny's expression was yeah uh, but that was it that was it <laughs> I was yeah. like I'm thinking that's probably as far as we but can go with that that was all that. I to say is because like you said we appreciated him and how great he was that look was all I needed to know. Is okay, like, yeah, that's it. No more. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, four and a half seconds is the uh, the cutoff. <laughs> they stopped rolling the wax after that point. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, it, for us, especially as horn players, L.A. and New York are the two centers. There's great players in every city in the United States, Canada, Europe, without question. But for American players, typically, you, if you if you're really going to try to make a mark and not to say that you can't do it any in other cities because i mean i know great players in pittsburgh i know great players in seattle and san francisco chicago certainly nashville incredible players dallas yeah. you know great players everywhere uh, i think it ends up being the depth of of the field that you get in la and new york i mean you go down your la you go down to your 10th 
call lead trumpet player, it's probably still going to be really, really good. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is, especially with young players, a lot of players seem to gravitate towards going to, to Los Angeles. Um, I heard uh, my, uh, as and you've known him for years now, my young son Zach, who's uh, turning into a very formidable trumpet player himself, and, and uh, he was playing on a recital for somebody at Manhattan School of Music last year, and I went and heard the recital. And really, really phenomenal uh, young lead player. His name escapes me at the moment, and he was a student of Tony's. Uh, anyway, he moved to L.A., and he was a good example of this. Like, mm -hmm. what... When you look at the two coasts and the, and the difference between that, maybe even stylistically, but um, how do you perceive the situation? Do you ever think about, oh, I should have moved to L.A.? I know I do all the time, but uh, do you ever think, wow. Well, that's because you, you love New York. <laughs> <laughs> but do you ever think about that? And, and also, you know, uh, what, you know, what causes younger folks maybe to kind of gravitate to L.A.? I think there's a, a in terms of a total number, L.A. has more great lead trumpet players than New York does. I think I think that would be safe to say. Certainly, I think there's great players on both coasts. But anyway, long, long drawn out uh, question. What's your thoughts about that? Well, um, we're going to edit this, right? Uh, <laughs> well, no, I, the first thing that comes to mind is the joke that I use with uh, uh, with kids. When, if I hear like a young, really good lead trumpet player, or a really good jazz player, I'm like, man, you sound great. Oh, well, thank you. I said, you know, you would kill it in L.A. <laughs> and they don't understand that I'm just trying to say, yeah, don't take my work, just move out there. But, uh, well, you know, honestly, and again, this actually goes back to my friend, uh, my eighth grade band director, Steve. Will, uh, Steve and I still talk about this. We always try to, because he still constantly is finding new old records. And uh, I was just at his house Wednesday night, and he gave me four new, he, he gave me some new records. Like, hey, check this stuff out, and you're trying to. Uh, figure out that like he, he plays these listening tests with me kind of like they do in, in um, is it is it downbeat they do that right right and he's like, all right you know not only what coast it's because sometimes it's not coast sometimes it's the great Derek Watkins who is one of my favorite lead trumpet players mm. mm -hmm. period ever rest in peace but what era what coast who's playing lead you know <laughs> and then if if I get it it's like, all right well who's on drums who's on lead out there but one of the things we always try to pinpoint is where in our opinion, or I don't want to lump him, him in on this and get him in trouble, but I'll use my, I'll say me. Because um, right in the 50s and into the 60s, and I have several examples of this, uh, you know, remember guys used to move coast to coast, right? You, you'd be in New York for a while and you'd be like, oh, I want to change a pace. Move out to L.A. and do the studio stuff out there, the TV stuff out there. Gotta love that, like, that was actually an option, right? It was, <laughs> oh, this, you know, no like, kidding, uh, right? I mean, First, of course, off the top of my list, you know, was Porcino. All the great records he did out there in the 50s and early 60s. And then he went, ah, ah I'm going to move to New York. And then did all this great stuff out here. And then left, went back there for a little bit, then came back and then said, I fell in love with a, a German. I was just going to move to Germany and play lead in the radio band. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that, make, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> like, <laughs> nowadays, you're imagining these options. But so, I think because even though I only used one example, there was, not only, it, it was popular music of the time, which was the music that we play, but because of this transparency between the coasts, the time centers were and sound, actual conception of sound for not only lead trumpet, but I just mean horn players in general, were very similar. Hmm. In my opinion, through the 50s, through the 60s into the early 70s. In my opinion, in the early 70s when it started to change was now we're, of course, now you're getting the new crop of generation of musicians. The popular music, of course, has changed by this point. And um, now we're listening uh, to uh, a record that just, uh, off the top of my uh, head, um, you know, Jack Doherty, mm -hmm. those Jack Doherty mm -hmm. records, and a record that I love, I mean, uh, because Chuck Finley is one of my favorite drummer players ever. Of course. Uh, Chuck's playing on this, I think it's Class of 72, and uh, Paul Humanon, rest in peace, and, and the, Chuck and Paul were very good friends. Um, in 72, in, on this record, you can still hear a similar time center to what was happening in New York at that point. 
But as stuff started to change in the 70s with the advent of, uh, not only had the music changed, the demands of what we needed to do changed. Mm -hmm. And when Jerry Hay, mm -hmm. who was also like one of my heroes, of came in Jerry, Gary, and Chuck in that section doing all those, for decades, all those great records. Um, and I don't mean this in a bad way, of course, at all. I just, uh, in my opinion, the time center got a little more compressed and a little more middle to front, whereas New York was still middle to back. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is maybe mid to late 70s was when the divide started a little bit. And now I notice that the East Coast Time Center, which is what I hear more naturally, because I grew up on the East Coast, is now middle to middle back versus middle to middle front. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's a very general statement. I don't mean to, to make it even more of a, your question even more broad than it was, but, um, and especially, this is also colored by my experiences, you know, playing in, in big bands, playing the Vanguard band, where our time center is a very specialized thing. Uh, if I'm playing in a, a salsa band or a mambo band, of course, my time center is not going to be middle to back. It's going to be more on the front side of the beat. But I, I've noticed that not only the time centers have changed in the past 30 to 40 years, sound concept has changed. Hmm. And I think uh, n neither one is better or worse. It's just what you hear. I think the East Coast sound is a little more, uh, still a little more um, owey and sonorous, whereas, and this could just be recordings, of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the recording quality or compressing sounds, but uh, the West Coast sound is a little more slick sounding than we are. And I mean that in a good way, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. when I hear some of these records, when I because I still listen all the time, when I hear Wayne or chuck or gary play i'm sitting there going gosh i, I wish i could sound like that i can't so maybe this is just me being in denial saying oh you guys sound great doing that yeah i, I don't like the way that sounds I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stick to this you know uh i have many blind blind spots in my self-perception but overall I, I really just think the difference in the coast is as has really started those couple of decades ago, and it's really just more about the time center. But mm -hmm. I think the reason I say more about the time center is not because these guys have, you know, we have bad time or good time or they have bad time or good time. It's the work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. L.A. has turned much more into a, uh, back then, it was they were still recording a lot more than we were. Uh, we had, um, you know, studio bands and, and, and doing stuff, but the studio center was still became much more centered out there. We were the more live thing. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I still think that is, mm -hmm. is kind of still the way it is. So I think that's a large part of it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. And I think, uh, and again, I'm prefacing this by saying, I mean, no offense because the ma the names I just mentioned are like some of my favorite trumpet players on the planet. No, I think, uh, absolutely. I didn't, uh, think there's any offense in, in, in anything you just said. I think that uh, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, if you're in the studio all the time and you're that's the way you're listening. Because I know that's, um, for me personally, like I've gotten a lot out of, you know, on my own projects. But just in general, I mean, when Rob Mouncey writes a chart, you get to play a chart of that quality, which is as good as anything that's ever been written. And you go in the booth and listen to that. That's a different feeling than playing in a Broadway show where you're kind of like, you know, you're evaluating how you're sounding. You're trying to sound your best, but you're not like having an opportunity to go in and, and really evaluate it on a, as a second listening. You're only listening as, yeah. a, as a, in a live perspective. So I think that I could see totally where, and I totally agree with all the things you just said, but I could see from a time perspective especially, but also sound, but time in particular... Uh, when you're in the studio, there's no room for, you know, I mean, you, especially when you're playing with a pop track that, where there's, there's no real uh, interpretation of where the eighth notes are or yeah. the quarter notes. Is, and so I think, I think that there's something to be said for that. When you're recording, you're listening to it. Uh, you, the, the level of evaluation is, is going to cause you to react in a different kind of way. And like, you, actually, I mean, you just kind of touched on it. A lot of the recording now, right, 
stuff is laid down and you're playing on top of it, i.e. you're not negotiating the time with the rhythm section, you're not playing live together, you're having to do what's already, you're laying something on top of what's already been done. In that case, you really have no choice. Right. Where you're right. going to put the time. You have to play with what's already pre-recorded. Yeah, super good point. And I think, you know, from a creative standpoint, you could make a debate on that. I mean, there's certainly, you go hear the Vanguard band, that there's a very organic feeling. It's as, it's as tight as anything I've ever heard, but it also feels like there's fluidity to it, pull, you know, yeah. and it's, it's in, a, in the most positive, I mean, I love it. It's like, makes me like, man, I just want to hear this all the time, you know. Yeah, but it's um, a lot of push and pull. Yeah. But, it's, but there's, there's a fluidity to it that's, uh, that's very cool. Um, well, Nick, man, I can't thank you enough for uh, being our guest this month oh, in November. Right. You uh, are times uh, up already. Here. <laughs> I could go on for another hour. I feel like, <laughs> uh, but but I, I do want to just kind of pick your brain a little bit about what's coming. Uh, what's coming next for Nick Marchion? What uh, I know, I know on the Broadway front, you're doing uh, Holiday Inn right now, getting ready to do uh, Hello Dolly with Bette mm -hmm. Midler, which I'm sure is going to be huge uh, starting in the spring. Um, obviously, more work with the Vanguard Orchestra. Probably the greatest gig you're ever going to do will be the Hip Bone Big Band December pretty 4th much. at Subculture. Yeah, it's yeah, fair to much. say. Uh, yeah. yeah. What time sound check? <laughs> but I'm thrilled that you could do that gig. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure oh, what we'd do if you couldn't pleasure. do it. But but anyway, that aside, all kidding aside, um, what's on what's on deck for you? What are you looking forward to uh, next? And uh, what, uh, on deck, what, I did uh, just one or two hits. Um, uh, I want to do a. Uh, I'm going to do a quintet project uh, with Luis Bonilla. Oh, nice! Great trombone player Luis Bonilla. Phenomenal. Trombone Apparently, player. I cannot get enough of trombone in my <laughs> life. That, as opposed to doing the standard, I'll play with a sax player. I have to choose a trombone player. Uh, but um, I had this idea of doing. I did a, a gig down in Philadelphia with this uh, quintet. Um, actually especially pulling Luis in, who's in, in the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra doing the music of Thad Jones and some tunes that were not, that Thad wrote specifically for the big band that are just, of course, such great melodies and uh, tunes in and of themselves that they would be great in a quintet uh, form. So we're negotiating doing uh, some more gigs and then doing a record of that. Oh, with, nice. Uh, I'll look forward to hearing that. Yeah, it'll be great. For those of you who don't know, Luis Bonilla, amazing trombone player and Got to get him uh, in this well, you chair have have one, one of these days. You have to have one front man who can play jazz. <laughs> I'll just play lots of chas and it'll be great. It's a match made in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great to see you as always, Nick. And, uh, and uh, once again, we will see all of you next time. Uh, just as a quick reminder, December 4th, we'll be at Subculture uh, in East Village. Uh, with the Hip Bone Big Band featuring Nick Marchion on lead trumpet. And uh, we thank all of you for uh, being with us. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we will see you in December on Bone to Pick. Bye. Can I get more mixer?